long as it's not myelin. As long as it's not the correct yeah. one. Okay. <laughs> well, so, so Milan uh, Ney is going to talk to us, and he's got his uh, handout in, in our chat box, I believe. Yes. So I put a handout in the chat box. Um, the handout mostly contains example texts that I'm discussing, so it doesn't have any points, uh, any kind of bullet points, or anything, um, but it might be helpful for some people to follow along with the talk. Thanks very much. Go, go for it, Milan. Okay, yes, I'm also, um, um, I also have a presentation, so um, let me just try to set that up. <laughs> um, how do I share? Um, application. Can everybody see the presentation? Hello? Yes. Okay, great. <laughs> um, Okay, so I'm talking about the uses of metaphor and hermeneutic of resistance, mostly discussing some examples in this talk. Um, a rough outline, I will first talk about um, just a few words about how I understand metaphors as, as tools for thinking, um, then introduce the distinction between two moments of hermeneutic resistance um, and talk about uh, hermeneutic resistance in general. Um, those two moments are exoteric and esoteric hermeneutic resistance. Um, then I'll say a bit about the use of metaphors in exoteric hermeneutic resistance, and then move on to three different examples um, involving uh, the use of metaphors in esoteric hermeneutic resistance. And I kind of titled those, described those as um, the exhibition of hermeneutic injustice through interpretation resisting metaphors, hermeneutic resistance through minimalist metaphors, and hermeneutic resistance through property denoting metaphors. Okay, so let's start. Um, in a kind of formulation that I find quite insightful that I take from Daniel Dennett from a rather different context, metaphors are tools for thinking. They're kind of ubiquitous in the way we talk. Um, by some estimations, um, uh, one in three sentences of English contain a metaphor. Um, they affect our way of thinking, um, both in ways that are like um, evident to us and in ways that are not evident to us. Um, and they can enable us to form and communicate novel thoughts that we might not otherwise have been able to form and to communicate. This is described, for example, not first, but in a kind of very French account, um, or in a kind of very nice account by Elizabeth Camp in 2006. Um, in the full paper version of this talk, I rely on uh, the structure mapping account of how metaphors are processed uh, that has been developed by Deirdre Gentner. Um, but I think for this talk, um, that's going into much detail. So I just talk about um, metaphor and kind of a intuitive terms, right? When I talk about specific metaphors and how we interpret them, kind of naive intuitive terms. Uh, I'm just hand waving here that I can kind of cash that out all in a more formally rigorous uh, account as well. Um, and metaphors being tools for thinking in this way makes them prima facie uh, useful. Uh, it looks like they might prima facie be useful um, for what Jose Medina has called hermeneutic resistance. Uh, he describes this as the phenomenon which a dissident voice revels against mainstream voices who propagate and enact hermeneutic injustice. Um, should understand that probably as a kind of uh, collective process um, in which uh, different members of a kind of oppressed group or their allies uh, cooperate to to make certain speech acts and to, to speech acts and to um, articulate uh, certain aspects of their experience. Okay, uh, now what are what is exoteric and esoteric hermeneutic injustice? Well, first let's repeat a bit about uh, hermeneutic injustice. In hermeneutic injustice, uh, members of oppressed groups are prevented from let's say adequately articulating their own experiences um, and aspects of the world that are relevant to their experiences um, due to their hermeneutic and marginalization and the lack of conceptual resources in the, in the pool of the um, epistemic community that results from that marginalization. Um, <clears throat> Um, so the standard example that um, Miranda Frick of this has is, of course, the case of Kamita Wood and sexual harassment. Um, both Hussein Medina and um, Mason have criticized this in a way by pointing out that it seems that Wood and her allies had some kind of kind of conceptual resources, some kind of understanding um, of their experience as kind of a harm done to them, even before they uh, came together and developed the concept of sexual harassment. They didn't have this kind of understanding after all, um, why would they have come together in those groups? Um, and partly kind of inspired by this criticism, I 
I propose distinguishing two moments in hermeneutic injustice. Those are not necessarily two different kinds of hermeneutic injustice, but two moments that probably coexist to different degrees in every instance of hermeneutic injustice. There's exoteric hermeneutic injustice, which consists in members of the oppressed group as being prevented from articulating their understanding to outsiders, especially outsiders who belong to the dominant group, um, even though um, exoteric commuting justice might, might exist, even though um, among each other and to themselves, uh, the members of the press group have adequate means, adequate resources of articulating um, their experience. Um, in contrast, in esoteric hermeneutic injustice, members of the press group uh, are even uh, prevented from adequately articulating their experience to themselves and to each other in this group. Um, given that maybe the understanding of one's own experience might well be kind of a social process that always involves others and that the kind of dominant uh, conceptual scheme can never kind of completely be uh, isolated, prevented from influencing the kind of uh, conceptual scheme used within the uh, in-group, within the oppressed group. Uh, those are like two moments that probably always coexist. Um, so I'm not sure whether you can ever have exoteric community injustice without having any esoteric community injustice. You clearly can't have esoteric community injustice without also having exoteric community injustice. Um, but I think it's useful to kind of distinguish uh, those two moments. Um, and those two moments also correspond to different moments or aspects of community resist resistance. Um, and I will structure the rest of this talk by talking about those two different um, aspects of hermeneutical resistance. Um, so first of all, let's talk about exoteric hermeneutical resistance and specifically the use of metaphors in exoteric hermeneutical resistance. In exoteric hermeneutical resistance, a kind of group, an oppressed group, members of the oppressed group that have an adequate understanding of some aspect of the experience, um, still struggle because of the hermeneutical marginalization um, to convey that understanding adequately to the dominant group and maybe thereby reach some practical goals as well. Um, and um, I suggest that they can use um, metaphors um, uh, in kind of overcoming that uh, exoteric hermeneutical injustice. Um, an example of that I use in the paper is the history of the concept of exploitation of labor. Um, originally, until the early 1830s, the term exploitation in English and in other languages um, has positive connotations and only has positive connotations. You might still talk about exploits as like some kind of um, uh, feed that we achieve, um, and it basically meant um, the optimal use of a certain resource, um, of the soil, of a mine, and so on. Um, that was exploitation, uh, what exploitation meant. And then in the 1830s, um, inspired by French socialists and maybe by the American evolutionist movement, English socialists start using the phrase exploitation of labor. Um, and this is at least originally a metaphor. And in the metaphor, a new negative connotation for exploitation emerges. Um, it kind of uh, implies that the, worth, uh, that the wor worker uh, who is exploited is exhausted, kind of destroyed and treated like an object. And this is kind of presented as a very negative uh, and harmful thing. And this enables the socialists to articulate their understanding of immoral and harmful work relations in a way that uh, uh, would not have been able, they would not have been able to do using the other conceptual resources um, in the dominant uh, conceptual framework. You know, uh, there people might have thought um, as the work relation simply as a free contract uh, between kind of liberal um, individuals, or even as um, you know, you know, this the employer giving the worker work, almost like like charity or like a benefit to the worker. Um, this new metaphor enables them to articulate the understanding that they already well have um, of their work relation as uh, something harmful and immoral. Uh, there might be some worries about whether workers, uh, the working class in this context, should count as a hermeneutically marginalized group, um, but I think we can argue for that pretty strongly just by kind of working all day or working a lot, working under these exploitative conditions, and also through certain um, identity-based symbolic exclusions, you know, based on accent, accents and um, things like that, uh, members of the working class um, were excluded from contributing to the shared hermeneutical resources. Okay, so why might we think that metaphors are useful or what is it about metaphors that makes them useful uh, to exoteric hermeneutical uh, resistance? Well, I suggest that there are two aspects. Um, firstly, um, they are automatically processed. 
and that's described by Thiebu Don Boroditsky. So if I encounter metaphor as a reader, I kind of automatically process it. And even if I reject the statement that it's part of in the end, uh, processing that metaphor will have affected my thinking. And therefore, uh, um, metaphors can be useful to overcome or defeat a kind of conscious resistance uh, to the epistemic contributions of repressed groups, kind of those kind of resistances uh, that exist in the minds, um, minds of members of the dominant group. Um, secondly, and relatedly, but in a more um, kind of philosophical and less kind of empirical psychological vein, uh, metaphors seem to exhibit um, a specific kind of anti-deniability as described by Camp and uh, Dick Moran. Um, and that is that in order to felicitly deny a metaphorical statement, like kind of any statement, I need to acknowledge that I've understood it. If I don't, if I haven't understood a statement, I can't felicitously deny it, right? Um, at the same time, however, if I acknowledge that a metaphor is intelligible, I acknowledge much of the point of the metaphor. So an example for that you can use is that um, if you're like in a circle of friends and somebody calls your friend a rat in a metaphor, right? Uses a kind of very nasty metaphor about them. And you snicker about that. You indicate your understanding of that metaphor. Um, and then you kind of immediately fast say, oh, no, no, that's not true. She's not a rat or whatever. You kind of try to deny that statement. Well, you have already indicated your understanding of that metaphor. And so you owe your friend an apology for that. Um, or you might at least owe your friend an apology for that, because by acknowledging that the metaphor was intelligible, you have acknowledged much of the point of the metaphor. And this kind of anti-deniability might mean that groups engaging in exoteric community resistance can use this, first of all, to successfully perform some illocutionary acts, uh, speech acts that they could not otherwise perform, right? Just say things and do things with uh, language that they might not otherwise successfully do because they get this, uh, uptake that is and irresistible in a sense. Um, and secondly, they might perform perlocutionary acts, by which I just mean uh, that they could not otherwise perform, by which I just mean uh, they might achieve certain effects. So um, the heroes might find themselves that they kind of have acknowledged the point of this metaphor, and so to reduce cognitive dissonance, uh, they might move to agree more um, with the views uh, kind of uh, capturing the metaphor than they would have otherwise. Okay, so this is exoteric commuting injustice. Let's move on to esoteric commuting resistance and specifically um, the, first, uh, the first aspect, which is the exhibition of hermeneutic injustice uh, through interpretation assisting metaphors. Um, there's a lot of examples here. There are a lot of poems. Um, kind of don't want to read them out because it's awkward and I'm not great at uh, reading poetry. Um, but this is a poem uh, by Paul Chilan, um, who was a survivor of the Shoah, uh, and who wrote that afterwards, um, and uh, it's called The Death Fugue. Okay, this is, um, well, so, so even the, the last poem was just the first stanza of the Death Fugue, it's much longer. This is a few lines in the beginning um, of Nally Sachs, Oh, the Chimneys. Um, she's a bit less well known than Paul Chilan, um, but um, they were close friends. They, uh, they kind of um, often exchange about their poetry um, and uh, kind of, she was also a survivor of the Holocaust. And um, as, as, as you might uh, recognize in this poem, um, tries to somehow express or kind of uh, write poetry that, that relates to that experience. Okay, so it is a kind of much acknowledged point um, in among um, German studies and among literary scholars writing about the work of uh, Sachs and Celan, that their work uh, resists interpretation, right? And specifically that the metaphors in Sachs and Celan's work, Sachs and Celan's work um, resist interpretation in a specific way. Um, and in fact, at least, um, Celan seems to express as, as much in some of his other poetry, um, where he says that, uh, where he kind of enjoins uh, the addressee of the poem, the kind of lyrical thou, um, which, from the context, it's clear that it is um, a Holocaust survivor like Chilan um, to, um, to 
speak clearly about the experience, but to put some shade in, so to put some obscurity and um, incompreh incomprehensibility in there. And we can see that. So if you look at metaphors like uh, the black milk or uh, the black and star um, in the two poems, uh, no attempt at interpreting, interpreting it seems fully adequate. Uh, like obviously we might think the blackness uh, kind of interprets uh, just signals harshness of death and uh, harshness of death and so on. And um, the oxymoron, the paradoxicality of black milk uh, might indicate the sometimes the contrariness to reason of the Shoah, uh, but none of these metaphors kind of, none of these interpretations on their own seem adequate. Um, and we also don't get the feeling like you might get with other metaphors, like we might get with Shakespeare's metaphors that, oh yeah, we, we can never fully grasp the metaphor, but we're always approaching it, right? We are approaching it and we can approach a kind of complete interpretation of the metaphor. Rather, the kind of metaphor seems to stay enigmatic, kind of any ability of interpretation, interpreting it just seems to be receding as we attempt to do it. Um, this is kind of not a new point I make. This is a fairly common point in the scholarship about these poems. Um, and then, it's also a fairly common point in the scholarship that through such interpretation of assisting metaphors, Chelan and Sykes exhibit the inability to articulate the experience of the Shoah uh, that is sometimes described as like unspeakability and the unspeakability of Auschwitz. Um, now a kind of new point that I want to make um, is that I say, that this inability is at least in part due to a hermeneutic injustice that Sachs and Shillan experience as victims of genocidal dehumanizing violence. Kind of people who have not experienced genocidal dehumanizing violence, be it in the context of the Shoah, um, or be it in the context of um, colonial genocides and colonialism, um, kind of obviously don't want to know about this. Um, uh, so such dominant groups end up um, marginalizing, excluding resources that could articulate this experience um, uh, marginalizing kind of uh, and excluding resources that could describe these experiences and even prevent the formation of such resources. And in fact, uh, I think there might be something even more fundamental about language um, and about like uh, the equality uh, that is implicit in, in like the human language game. Um, that means that almost whenever we speak, we might have to pretend uh, that such genocidal dehumanizing violence doesn't exist. So that there's an almost inevitable um, epistemic injustice there uh, for the victims of uh, genocidal dehumanizing violence. Um, and obviously um, we might imagine that if um, those people who survived other forms of genocidal dehumanizing violence would have been enabled and allowed to contribute to the shared epistemic resources, there would have been other conceptual resources available for people like Sachs and Shalan to articulate their experiences that were not actually available to them um, when they wrote their poems. Um, and as I argue that through writing such interpretation resisting metaphors, Sachs and Chilan exhibit uh, the epistemic injustice and the hermeneutic injustice they experience as, as survivors of genocide and dehumanizing violence, and thereby partic partic paradoxically find a way to maybe articulate or at least in a way point at that experience without kind of beautifying or downplaying it. Secondly, uh, my second example, um, kind of less harrowing, um, is uh, my poem by Emily Dickinson. Okay, um, there's a lot of poetry by Dickinson. There's some debate um, over whether it is to be interpreted metaphorically or not. I would just assume that it is to be interpreted metaphorically. And then we can see that Know, corresponding to different interpretations of what the strawberries metaphorically map on. Um, you know, this poem uh, can describe um, different goods that are unavailable to women in um, Dickinson milieu due to kind of patriarchal moral norms that might include a kind of um, joyous liberated sexuality, um, intellectual activity, um, writing and publishing specifically um, in the case of Emily Dickinson and other points. Um, and it is worth noting that a reader who only recognizes one of these readings would not appropriate the, would not appreciate the poem appropriately, right? Um, a reader who looks at this and says, oh, the strawberries, they metaphorically stand for 
okay, the free and joyous sexuality. They don't stand for anything else. That's what they stand for. That is the run re reading of the poem. Like they don't get it. They don't get the poem. Rather, the point of appreciating the poem is exactly recognizing that this metaphor can be interpreted in different ways. Uh, that makes it. Um, that makes this use of metaphor um, what um, Sweets and Sullivan in 2012 called a minimalist metaphor. And I suggest that through kind of using minimalist metaphors in these ways, Dickinson and her readers kind of can recognize structural similarities between different aspects of women's lives in her milieu. So they can recognize that both certain kinds of intellectual activity, public intellectual activity, um, free uh, kind of joyous liberated sexuality, and maybe um, other aspects of life are kind of all um, kind of are all made unavailable to women um, by certain patriarchal moral norms. Obviously, they wouldn't have the concept of a patriarchal moral norms or similar concepts. Um, and so that why kind of a poem like that is useful in hermeneutic resistance to kind of point out and make cognitively accessible um, those kind of structures, uh, those kind of structural similarities between different aspects of experience. Um, now, my third example, um, of esoteric community existence using metaphors um, comes from uh, the introduction or basically the whole of but here the part of from the introduction of uh, Invisible Man by Ralph Allison. Okay, um, in this invisible man, um, both in the introduction and really uh, more implicitly throughout the whole book, um, Ralph Allison uses inv invisibility as a source for a metaphor uh, to talk about the situation of black men or blacks in general in America. Uh, this metaphor seems to be partly based on um, phenomenology, so like uh, the quality of subjective experience, or at least um, an imagined quality of subjective experience. Being a black man in America, he suggests, um, feels like what a reader may imagine uh, feel, being invisible would feel like. And it is also based on systematic connections between the notion of seeing, right, and uh, seeing someone and acknowledging someone as a person. Uh, this is kind of part of ordinary language, a very common metaphor. And you might say, I see you in a sense of like, I recognize you as a person, I acknowledge you as a person. And so invisibility uh, relates to a kind of uh, lack of acknowledgement, lack of being recognized as a person. This kind of hints at uh, Hegelian notions of recognition uh, that a Marxist like Allison, um, at least for uh, lots of his uh, long time in his actual life being a Marxist, Allison would have been clearly familiar with, um, but it also, Kind of in order to understand this metaphor, and even in order to understand those aspects of the metaphor, you don't need to be familiar with Hegel or Marx, right? So it's not just the kind of shorthand for the kind of Hegelian or Marxian notion, um, but it picks out something um, in a similar neighborhood. Um, and um, I suggest that through the use of the metaphor, um, through the use of uh, kind of invisibility, Allison can refer to or denote a socially constructed property that otherwise could not be referred to. Kind of uh, this social construct, uh, social con socially constructed property of invisibility um, that is had, um, that is instantiated uh, by blacks uh, in 1950s America, by black men in 1950s in 1950s America. And kind of this way of referring to this property enables him and his readers to form and communicate thoughts about this property um, that otherwise might not have been able to be communicated and maybe might not have even been able to be formed in the same kind of clarity and with the same ability to think about it. Um, kind of other plausible examples of this happening um, include um, 
Fanon's existence in triple, um, where it similarly denotes a kind of socially constructed, partially experiential property um, instantiated uh, by uh, members of an oppressed group, and um, Bell Hook's metaphor of eating the other, where it refers to a type of attitude, to a kind of attitude that is typically exhibited by members of uh, a dominant group. I also should point out that I don't think um, that um, this is kind of the only use of metaphors that is instantiated in those texts, in those texts, and in kind of texts by um, by black writers and a kind of decolonial writers more generally. I think that, for example, some of the more um, enigmatic uh, aspects and uses of metaphors in Fanon might, similar to the writing of Chelan and Sachs, actually be metaphors that resist interpretation and thereby exhibit epistemic injustice. However, that point is kind of much more prepared for in the kind of secondary literature on Chelan and Sachs than it is in the secondary literature on those writers. So I kind of prefer to uh, express it and use Chelan and Sachs as examples for that. Um, we should point out that this kind of use of property denoting metaphors and hermeneutic resistance is related but distinct from hermeneutic resistance to minimalist metaphors. In our Dickens example, uh, like there's no way of referring to the patriarchal norms or to goods uh, that women are prevented from obtaining by patriarchal norms or so on. Uh, the source of the metaphor, so strawberry, uh, only ever refers to one instance of the common structure at the time. It can refer to different instances and a different interpretations, but it always only refers to one instance, right? So it doesn't pick out the structural property. However, um, we could imagine a minimalist metaphor developing into a property denoting one. You might imagine, for example, that a few generations later, people familiar, or like uh, some years later, people familiar with Dickinson's um, Work might say uh, joyous liberated sexuality and intellectual activity are both strawberries. Um, it's a bit, um, yeah. Um, and so if that happens, then that metaphor is actually used as a properly denoting metaphor. Okay, so as a final end note, I kind of uh, want to ask the question well, how does this project? Um, help uh, the kind of stuff that I do in this paper. In this paper, um, does it help the pr practice of hermeneutic injustice? It seems that practitioners of hermeneutic resistance don't need reflections from an Anglo-analytic philosophy of language, right? So Ralph Allison or Paul Trelan, um, Emily Dickinson, they don't need kind of uh, a white, ang white male Anglo-analytic philosopher to come there and say, "Oh, this is what you're doing." Right? Um, they've been getting along fine doing that without, without that. However, first of all, such reflections might help spread and echo uh, those speech acts, those acts of hermeneutic resistance in spaces where the Anglo analytic tradition carries prestige. Uh, and we might also imagine that some practitioners of um, kind of Anglo uh, of hermeneutic resistance, you know, uh, poets, writers, um, creative writers, uh, find it helpful. Like all kinds of information, including meta information from various traditions can be helpful in a creative endeavor. And finally, we might think that even if, it, if this kind of uh, paper doesn't contribute much to the practice of hermeneutic injustice, it can still help us understand hermeneutic resistance within the analytic philosophy of language, and it might improve our understanding of metaphor. So even if it doesn't benefit the practice of hermeneutic injustice much, we might think it doesn't harm it either, and it is um, of benefit, um, of a small benefit to kind of the Anglo-analytic tradition of philosophy of language, uh, which also has some value in itself. Okay. Okay, um, and that's it. <laughs>